How often does this happen to you? You're exploring a lost city when suddenly, assassins. You and your buddies try and run, but find yourself blocked in by a dead end. Those bright buildings stare back, now cold and unfeeling, trapping you in and drown drowning your hope. That, that's just the worst, right? If only you could jump two stories straight up into the air, be on the rooftops and just leave them in the dust. Well, in fifth edition, there's rules for that. In D&D 5th Edition, you can high jump a number of feet equal to 3 plus your strength modifier. That means that all those average low-level barbarians out there are jumping 6 feet into the air, which is it's impressive, but it's not roof scaling. So you can also reach half your height upwards, and that gets us to 9 feet, but a standard one-story building is 10 feet. So we're not going to get there on our own. We're better to look for help than magic. And what magic could possibly help us more than the aptly named jump? So jump is a first level spell available to sorcerers, wizards, druids, and rangers that lets you touch a creature and triple its jump distances for a full minute. Doesn't even need concentration. Suddenly, that plus three strength barbarian is jumping 18 feet up. Then we add in those two or three extra feet for reach, and we can get right on top of a two-story building. If you're a sorcerer, use metamagic to twin this spell and make two different party members look like they've never <gasps> skipped leg day. If you're a ranger, you might just have the strength to make that jump yourself. Now, you could be a good teammate and give your friends this jumping prowess and have them pull you behind them on a rope, but that's that's not why we're here. So let's build a strength-based character who can utilize this spell to its fullest potential. So we're gonna stat up a variant human barbarian, taking magic initiate as our free feat. That gives us two cantrips and one first level spell from a single spell list. Let's pick wizard. The cantrips we choose aren't important because they scale with intelligence and we don't have any intelligence, but just pick whatever seems fun. Once per long rest, we can cast jump and surprise every monologuing bad guy who thinks they're safe just because they're flying around in midair. Did I mention on top of all this that your long jump is just equal to your strength score flat? With a 16 strength tripled, you're jumping 48 feet. And in a 10 foot running start, you can cover 58 feet in a single move action and still attack. You just wanna make sure you cast jump before you start raging because after you start raging, you can't cast spells and that's, then you're just jumping nowhere. But let's get down to business and really bend these rules to their limits. Let's test the maximum altitude we can get. As a level nine monk, we can run up sheer vertical surfaces and liquids. That's pretty cool, but what happens if we use our 10 foot running start required to long jump and ran it up a vertical surface? We could argue that we are long jumping upwards. That way we can jump triple our strength score flat up into the air. So if we had the aforementioned 16 strength, we could run 40 feet straight up a vertical wall, launch ourselves 50 feet also straight up and be a total of 90 feet in midair. And as a monk, we don't take fall damage. We can use this to get our bearings in the woods or scale a castle wall in a single round of combat. But where are we gonna find sheer surfaces just out in the wild? Our paladin's tower shield. That's it, that's the only one. A quick alley-oop can get us onto a ledge 60 feet up in the air, or we can deliver a truly dramatic dive kick onto somebody who definitely deserves it. Every time I take the spell jump, it leads to one of those D&D moments that just gets talked about the entire campaign long. Not always in a good way, but it always does something, and it always gets me somewhere, even if it's in over my head. Jumping mechanics as a whole are so often overlooked in D&D, and that's a shame. The simple obstacle of crossing a hole in the ground or climbing a mountain is the perfect puzzle for a game where there are no right answers, and so very, very many wrong ones that will still work somehow. Jump is a tool that amplifies the creativity and resourcefulness of the players, and that's what makes it so rewarding. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for watching last week's There's Rules for That, which had a great response. I just wanted to pop in on the end of this one to bring up a few ideas that I saw in the comments of the last video. Uh, there were some really great ideas, and I think it'd be cool to talk about them. Uh, the number one thing I saw the most was people talking about the Titan Fighter archetype, which is a fighter archetype, instead of the Titan Mauler Barbarian archetype, which is what I used. And there's a couple of reasons I went with Titan Mauler instead. First, I really liked the thematic consistency between uh, the Titan Mauler going into Blood Rager, sort of that barbarian all the way thing. The other more important reason is that I have been trying to make this character for a very long time and my original build predates Titan Fighter. Y'all are right about that one. The penalties are less, um, it's pretty cool looking. The second thing I saw a lot of was people talking about getting the oversized limb traits from the uh, characteristic table for tieflings. I think this is very fun. Um, tieflings are always been uh, the king of choice in Pathfinder. Any sort of option that's possible to have, a tiefling can get some variation on it. And this is a really interesting one for tieflings specifically because I think they tend to run kind of too close to just red shaded human. And this doesn't let you do that. Fine, you want to be a demon person with an edgy past, you now have uh, hands that look like Hellboys. So 
good luck hiding in your edgy tavern then. And the third thing I saw a lot of was people talking about Vital Strike. And this is actually a really good point to bring up. Uh, Vital Strike has been kind of a long uh, maligned feat chain in Pathfinder because one, it makes you use an attack action to use it. That means you can't use it with a full attack, you can't use it with cleave, you just have to use whatever your character can do. You can make one attack and the idea is that it doubles your weapon damage or your damage dice. And normally in Pathfinder, mathematically speaking, you want to be multiplying your damage modifier. That's just the better flat rate to, to go after. But when we are using a Warhammer that is doing 8d6 of damage, we really do not need to be full attacking. And using Greater Vital Strike is a super great option for us. And so I think those were all super cool ideas. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about this video. And on top of that, if you have any ideas for convoluted rules topics you would like me to tackle in a whole new video, just put them in the comments. I'll look at them and see if I'm brave enough to try them. Thanks.